Good morning. How's everybody today on this beautiful, cold, crisp winter day and all? At least it's bright and sunny today, and, and we don't have that rain or uh, bad snow like they're having in some parts of the country. But uh, anyway, it's certainly been a brisk, cool couple of days here that we've got going. Let's take a look at our welcome and announcements this morning. First, of course, welcome. Welcome everyone here to Grace United Methodist Church. We're so glad you're here with us. Uh, please fill out the cards in the uh, bulletin there. If you're a visitor with us today, we'd love to have a record of it, and uh, we'd love to uh, contact you and invite you to come to our church at any time and uh, be a part with us and uh, join us in the worship of God and uh, come with us in the spirit of grace that grace, uh, grace protrudes to everyone and everywhere and all. So there, that's a little welcome for you and a welcome that I want to extend at any time. Our announcements... Uh, we have two or three things there on the back of your bulletin if you want to take a look at them. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to sign up for the Grace United Methodist newsletter. You can uh, visit the, uh, the site there online and sign up. Also, you can sign up for text messaging if you want to from Grace if you're not already doing that. The Handbell Choir is planning a meeting Wednesday, uh, January 26th at 6 p.m. in the choir room. No experience needed. Uh, I'm sure Brother Gary will take care of that without any problem, get you set right up into that if you want to become a part of this, uh, this ministry of the Handbell Choir. Uh, the 2021 Super Bowl, and that's soup, S-O-U-P, Super Bowl, uh, is here, and uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to collect money, and the money is uh, $384 that we're trying to collect. That's a dollar per member. That's how many members are on the rolls here at Grace. And so if you would... Uh, Donate the money. You can do it today if you want to. The, the envelopes there in the pews, you can uh, just mark them Super Bowl, put your money in it, and drop it in the plate, or you can uh, bring it by the office or anything like that. But uh, please do that. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, write them. Uh, write them on the response card and uh, send that in to us also. Or just put it in the, uh, the plate there today. Due to the recent spike in the, uh, the Omicron, the COVID, uh, please wear your mask as much as you can when you're in and around the, uh, the church. Of course, I know sometimes, just like now when I'm speaking, that's uh, not conducive because if you do that, well then I'm all muffled up and everybody's saying, well, what's he saying up there? Well, maybe you can hear me, I'm usually pretty clear, but with that mask on, sometimes it'll kindly muffle you down a little bit. We do have an announcement from uh, Alice Higginbotham this morning. Alice, uh, if you wanna come up here and uh, I, I know she's got something she wants to tell you about and talk with you a little bit about this morning. Well, hello. It's that time of year again. Yes, it's, you know, Super Bowl, Valentine's, but also it, Mardi Gras was coming up. And, yes, and so next week our theme for Fifth Sunday Lunch is going to be Mardi Gras. So I want you to come in your Mardi Gras colors, purple, gold. I know that's LSU. Kevin will love that too. Um, so we're going to do that. But also there is going to be a table, and in keeping with Mardi Gras, throw me something, mister, for CCA. So I encourage you to bring your funds, your, your money, your checks, whatever, and you can put it in our throw it something mister basket and retrieve um, some Mardi Gras beads that you can wear during lunch. So come, lunch is provided for you. I would ask if you are gonna come to lunch, please sign the attendance where it says um, that you're coming and how many people are gonna come with you so we will know how much to prepare, always we have plenty, so please invite people to come if uh, they would like to. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And uh, now we uh, have a little video. Uh, Brother Gary, you wanna talk about it a minute? All right, go ahead and play the video.
same student. That's about 13 minutes part of it you see up there. And a lot of people don't realize that we're fortunate here today to have the entire four arches that you just saw that we play. This is just a sample of those four arches. This is one arch of the bell right here. And this really only requires about two to three people to play this short section, but that's pretty boring just to have this many notes. So we had those four arches, and all that's required for you to be able to be a part of the handout class is to be able to do this right here. Who doesn't feel good when we do that? <laughs> we, had, we had a handout choir, a full four, uh, four arches choir, about 10 years ago. And since then, we had a lot of people who couldn't make their virtual and uh, the choir kind of went away. So we're trying to start it up again. There's a renewed interest. There's a lot of people that have been asking that have not been part of the choir. And they get to learn some good little technique, like this right here. There's plucking. There's going down into the table like this. And you get to use mallets too. Main thing you need to know about these handbells is you cannot touch the bell at all with your bare hands. So we practice with gloves. So if you're interested in being a part of the handbell choir, we start up this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And it's going to be more of an organizational meeting and maybe teaching a few uh, different techniques of how to hold the handbells and how to set up the tables and all. But we would surely love to have you as part of the handbell choir. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Here, that certainly sounds like an a interesting and exciting uh, ministry. I invite everyone to come and participate if you have an interest in that. Uh, I think you will find it uh, very fulfilling and all. If you would now join me in our opening prayer. Uh, again, welcome here today. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for this day in your kingdom. Thank you for all the great blessings that you have bestowed on us, our lives, and our family. Be with us, be with our family, be with our country, be with our leaders. Give us guidance. Open our minds today to understand the words and the teachings that are to be brought forth to us. Be with us throughout this week. Remember those that are sick and afflicted. Stretch out your healing touch. Help us daily with all of the things that only God can provide for us. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Today, uh, Brother Smith is at uh, St. Paul's over in Monroe. And uh, that is a church that he had his first appointment at a long time back. And they're celebrating 70 years of being uh, a, uh, a United Methodist Church there in the Monroe area. I actually used to attend St. Paul's about 20 years ago. It was kind of, uh, I think it was a little bit uh, after or before, it was before Brother Smith was actually a part of it. But uh, he's going to be there preaching today, and so that's why he having to put up with me this morning. He's nobody here to make the announcements because Brother Nick is going to bring us a message. I think it's going to be exciting, interesting, and I can't wait to uh, hear it because he is, of course, a, a dynamic speaker that I think you'll really enjoy. Uh, in the meantime, you just have to listen to me for a few minutes, and then Brother Nick will be here, and we'll be able to move right on along. Next on our agenda this morning, our affirmation of faith. Uh, please stand and uh, join me in the affirmation of faith. It is uh, in your United Methodist hymnal on page 889. It comes from 1 Timothy, and I think it's also on the screen. There is one God and there is one mediator, Jesus Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory, Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen.
Amen. Uh, as we go in to prayer this morning, uh, I ask that you would excuse my raspy voice. I am healthy. I got cleared by a doctor to be here. I got my flu shot this week, and it put me on my rear. So I am recovering from that. Uh, bear with me in that regard. Uh, we do have a few things uh, that we need to lift up in prayer. I had one late announcement come to me. Friendship Club will happen on February 1st. Uh, so uh, board games in the CLC and then lunch after that. I believe it'll be a bring your own lunch type of thing as it was last month, but Friendship Club February 1st. As we go before the Lord in prayer, uh, who and what do we need to lift up to the Lord this morning? Yes, ma'am. Amen. A scope for grandson Brody, last name? Brody McCoy. Other prayer concerns? Philip Washington. Other prayer concerns? Okay. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Jesus, we come before you now, and we just lay everything that we're dealing with at your feet. We know that you are our rock. We know that you are our redeemer. We also know that you're our healer. Uh, those of you that are dealing uh, with uh, physical things that we need healed, Lord, uh, I ask that you would intervene. Those of us that have uh, friends and relatives that need you spiritually, I ask that you would show up in their lives in a mighty way. Lord, we ask that you would be with Brody McCoy, with the scope that's going on. We ask that you would be with the needs of Philip Washington. I ask that you would be with Brother Kevin this morning as he preaches over at St. Paul. I pray that they would have a good reunion. I pray that they would have fun. I pray that the Spirit of God would move in that place today as it has for the past 70 years. Lord, this morning I ask that uh, everything that we are dealing with would seem small and almost just like dust in the wind as compared uh, to the glory that you've given us in Jesus Christ. Uh, with one voice this morning, we as a congregation say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into the offering portion of our service, uh, if you would, let's pray over the gifts that God gives. Father, this morning that uh, we ask that everything that we give would be uh, acceptable to you. We know that we are only returning to you the things that you have already given to us, so we ask that you would bless, multiply, and use it for the building up of your kingdom. And we say all this in Jesus' name, amen.
started singing, Oh Jesus, I Have Promised. morning. How are you guys doing today? Doing well? A little cold. I look a little sleepy. I feel that. All right. I want you to think of a time you've been part of a club or a special group, something that you really enjoyed being a part of. Can you think of something? A, a group you've ever been in, maybe like a special class you got to take, a special trip you got to go on. Could be a family trip, anything like that. I'm going to let y'all think. I can think of something I was in, and it's probably really nerdy, but I really enjoyed it. I was in the calligraphy club when I was in school, and so anytime you've ever seen really fancy writing, really swirly writing, sometimes you see it on like a very fancy Bible or old books. I was in a club that learned how to write like that, and it was very cool because I could just write something that wasn't even that fancy, but it looked good, and I could give it to people as a present. And I was very excited to tell people all about um, how you learn to write, write calligraphy and show them my fancy pen. So I, I ask about that and I share my experience like that and I want you to think about something that may be like that for you because scripture tells us that God has gathered all of us who are Christians into a special group. We're called a holy nation, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, all these names that God has called the people who are Christians 
And he's gathered us together because we get to experience things with God as his children that other people don't know about because they're not yet in that group. And he gathered us together because he wants us to be able to share with people all of the, the special and fun and exciting and beautiful things that we know and experience as part of that group. And he wants us to go out and tell everybody all about all the great things about him and all the great things that we experience with him so that they can get to be a part of that group too. So y'all may not be very interested in the calligraphy club and that's okay. But it is very exciting that we get to be part of the holy nation called Christians. And it's our job to tell other people about what it's like to be in that nation with God so that they can want to be a part of it too, okay? So I'm trying to think about that throughout the week. And if you get any experiences to share, any chances to share about what it's like to know God and be in a relationship with him, you should absolutely take it, okay? All right, let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much that you saw us and chose us to be a part of your holy nation, your royal priesthood, your chosen people. We pray that your Holy Spirit will empower us to share the great experience that we have as being Christians and getting to know you so that others will get to know you and desire to be a part of your nation as well. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Gary. Thank you, choir. As we continue in worship, and if we could, I'd just like to build off that beautiful song. Um, we're going to talk about what it is to live a lifestyle that exemplifies that beautiful God that we worship. Uh, we are going through a series right now that is called Jesus, a light to the nations. And we're going to be looking at a scripture from the book of First Peter, chapter 2. Uh, we're going to be in verses 9 through 12 this morning. It'll be on the screen. Uh, if you could, I'll read uh, verses 9 through 11, and then we'll read verse 12 together. So let's read the word of God, First Peter, chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 12. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may be declared, that you may declare the praises of him who have, has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your souls. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Let's read that last verse together. Live such good lives among the pagans, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Let's pray. God be with us this morning. I ask that you would be uh, in every facet of our lives, those things that we keep hidden from you, those things that we sometimes don't like to even acknowledge that are there. I ask that uh, you would see that this morning, uh, that we would be a royal priesthood, that we would be a holy nation. I ask that this scripture would do a work in our lives today. I ask that we would leave here knowing something we didn't know, uh, feeling something we didn't feel, and being changed spiritually from the inside out. We say all this in the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Uh, the scripture today talks about the idea of a holy nation, a holy nation. Uh, the word I want to deal with first is holiness. Uh, I don't know if you may remember this, you may not, but a few years ago, Joey Romero came and preached a message uh, during, it was maybe one of our GIC weekends, or maybe he was just coming to give a missions update for us, and he preached a message, and it was simply entitled, Holiness. Holiness. Holiness is a consistent theme all throughout the Bible, and the illustration that he used that morning has stuck with me ever since then. Uh, he said, if I have a group of rocks right here, and I take one rock out of that rock, and I sanctify it over here, and I set it aside, and I make it separate, and I make it different, and I set it apart and consecrate it different from all the rest of these rocks right here, that rock is considered holy. It's not that I didn't like these rocks right here, but I have chosen this rock and set it aside to make it holy and so that it can be a messenger to the rest of these rocks. You and I are called to live lives as holy people. Holiness has to do, yes, with the way we act, yes, with the way we talk, yes, with the way we treat other people. But holiness mainly has to do with the idea that we are separate. We are different. We are away from the rest of the world and the way that we live our lives that the rest of the world, or if you will, the rest of those rocks are looking at that other rock. And they say that there is something different about that rock. The scripture this morning is written by Peter. Peter is writing uh, to a uh, wide range of people. This is in uh, Rome. This is uh, somewhere between uh, probably 60 and 64 A.D. Let me kind of set the context here. Peter is writing, uh, the fifth chapter of this book says he is writing from a place called Babylon. Babylon is not the physical place that Peter was at, but Babylon was the code name that the Christians in the first century early church used to describe Rome. Rome was, uh, it, it epitomized everything the Christians were against. The Romans worshipped Caesar. Romans, uh, in collaboration with the Jewish priesthood, killed Jesus. Rome was persecuting Christians. 
And Peter is writing uh, to a group of people, uh, most likely under intense persecution that he is facing there in Rome. And he's writing to God's exiles and elect. This is how he opens this letter. He says, to God's elect, the exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled by his blood. He is writing to a group of people that are not all in one place. Notice this. To be a Christian in some ways and in some form and in some fashion is always to live life to some degree as an exile. I want that to sink in. We, we live in a nation in which we are afforded uh, the opportunity and the freedom to worship. But freedom is not imposition of any type of worship. We're not guaranteed that this is a predominantly Christian nation. And the trends are going the other way by the day. And in other parts of the world, that's already the norm. And these type of statistics come and go, and nations rise, and nations fall, and religions kind of ebb and flow. But for us as Christians that are supposed to be the ones that occupy till Christ comes, we are called to live lives that are different. And that means to live lives as exiles. Exile is something that is not new to the people that are calling themselves Christians. Christianity is the ultimate fulfillment of Judaism. And Judaism has a long history of exile. The people of God were exiles down in Egypt for 400 years in a land that was not their own. And then after they got brought into the promised land and they lived through uh, the kingdoms of Saul and they lived through the kingdom of David and they lived through the kingdom of Solomon and then the kingdom split because of their apostasy, they were then exiles in Babylon. 70 years in Babylon. And then after uh, the going back home to Jerusalem, not everybody made it back home. And now that Christ has come and Christ has died on the cross and Christ has been resurrected for our sins and Christ has now gone back to heaven, uh, the Christian religion is beginning to grow. At first it was just called the followers of the way. But now they uh, are called Christians and uh, because they are spreading fast and because they're not saying that Caesar is Lord, they have this early Christian creed, just three words, but it's the earliest Christian creed, even earlier than the Apostles' Creed. It says simply this, Jesus is Lord. They're being persecuted by Rome. Nero is the emperor in Rome. And Nero on a good day is crazy. Nero is, is, is crazy against his own people, but he is particularly against the Christians that are now starting to grow in number. And Nero is power hungry. And it's very uh, likely that the fire that took place in A.D. 64 in Rome was potentially caused by Nero because he wanted to burn down the city so he could rebuild it for himself. And the scapegoat for that fire were the Christians. That's about the time that this letter is written. Peter is writing and he is saying uh, to the elect, the chosen, uh, the called exiles, I'm writing this letter. And in the midst of this intense persecution that he is most likely under, he doesn't just sit and he doesn't just find uh, time to throw a pity party for himself and he doesn't just find time to feel sorry for himself. This is how he begins this letter. This is what he says. Praise be to the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until uh, the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last name. In all this you greatly rejoice, for thou know, though for a little while you have uh, had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, in the midst of this persecution and in the midst of this pain and in the midst of this intense uh, pressure that they are under, Peter is writing to them and he is encouraging them. Now, I want to remind us, although he is encouraging them, Peter himself is probably not living a wonderful life right now. Peter is writing from a place that he later in this book calls Babylon. P Peter, Peter's not writing from the Ritz-Carlton. Peter's not writing from the Holiday Inn. And Peter's not writing from the, what is the resort? Sandals Resort down in the Caribbean. Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Postcard, palm tree, margarita. 
He's, he, he's writing from a place of intense persecution, and he's writing to these people, and he is saying, God has chosen you. I know you feel like exiles, and I know you feel like strangers, and I know you feel like foreigners, but because of the power of Christ's resurrection, you have a new birth. And I know your trials, and I know you have greatly endured. There is a word of comfort there that I think you and I can take. No matter what you're going through, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been given new birth and freedom from our sins. Amen? Peter is writing to these people, and not only is there a principle that I think we can take home, but I think there's an example we can look at. Peter is not so down and out that he does not find time to encourage other people. No matter what you are going through, there's always somebody that's going through it worse. There's always somebody that's going through it worse, and you can always find some way to encourage somebody else. Craig Rochelle, former United Methodist pastor and uh, Christian author, he writes a book about the rise of social media in, in our current culture, and the, the book is entitled Hashtag Struggles. And, and he writes that one of the, uh, the, the things, the trends that has taken place in recent years with the rise of social media and the rise of smartphones is that markedly, I don't know how they uncovered the statistics, but markedly selfishness and narcissism is on the rise in our culture. Maybe y'all missed that, but it's happening. Selfishness and narcissism somehow measurably is on a rise in our culture. Yo, we are finding it harder and harder to get outside of ourselves and think of other people. One of the best pieces of advice that I ever received was that if you are ever depressed, if you are ever down and out, if you are ever uh, in, in a mess emotionally or spiritually or relationally, this is what you need to do. You need to get out and you need to go serve somebody. You need to go serve somebody. And you need to realize that the world does not begin and end with you that somebody most likely has things worse off than you do, and that you can always find some way to bless somebody else. Peter is writing in the midst of a place that he doesn't call uh, the holiday, and he calls it Babylon, and he is writing and encouraging others. Y'all, I, I can think of so many times in which people that have been uh, on, on sometimes just in immeasurable pain have found ways to encourage me. I imagine you probably can too, Amen. You, you, you have people that are going through just heartaches and hard times in life, and yet somehow they find a way to speak an encouraging word to you. They, they, they find a way to bless you. They find a way uh, to pray for you. They find a way to find some time to spend with you. They didn't have to, but they found something within them that made them look beyond themselves, and they tried to serve you. We need to be able to encourage other people. Something else I think we ought to be able to do from this. Not only is Peter the apostle, not only is he uh, now, 30 years later, the senior statesman in the church of Jesus Christ, not only is he uh, somebody that is now instructing converts in other areas, uh, Peter is also human. Peter is also human. And among all these persecuted, Peter's probably one of the most chief persecuted. He probably dies about five years after the writing of this letter. Peter's probably also writing to encourage himself. Y'all, I don't know if Peter has the benefit of a Christian community right now. I don't know if he sometimes was like Paul in, the, in a jail cell and had to be by himself. I don't know if he's in solitary confinement. I don't know if he's living in a house with other people. But I do know this. Sometimes the most encouragement that you and I can get, it needs to come from us. Amen. Amen. Uh, Christ has promised us himself. He has not always promised us other people. We have a worldwide connection of the body of Christ, but we are not always promised to be physically around people that can encourage us and give us a pick-me-up and give us a hug. Although that's wonderful, Paul says sometimes we need to be able to encourage ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What are psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are simply the word of God put to music. The whole book of Psalms is just at the word of God put to music. They would sing these things to themselves. Are you and I willing to memorize the word of God in such a way that whenever we get down and out, we can speak it to ourselves and we can say, wait a minute, this, this thing is, is not going to beat me. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. Amen. Uh, th this thing is not going to kill me. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I know Nero is after me. I know that life is not great right now. I know that I have to write a letter and encourage everybody else, and my life is kind of falling apart. But we need to be able to get to the point in our lives in which we can encourage ourselves. One way to do that is to meditate and know and memorize God's word. I would encourage you to do that. Whether it's uh, a Bible in a year daily reading plan, whether it's trying to memorize a different word uh, or a, a different part of the word of God every week in a Bible memory verse, whether it's trying to just put a psalm to memory, I would encourage and I would commend to you learning the word of God. Not necessarily so you can teach other people. That's good. But because you need it for yourself. Because I need it for myself. I shared with y'all a year ago, my granddad died in January, one year. On his deathbed, this man that I had never really seen to be a very religious person. He went to church, nice man, Episcopalian. You, y'all, most of y'all know Episcopalians, they don't really get outside of their shell. They have a way they do things, they stand up, they say, oh, come on, am I right? I mean, they, look, come on, it, it, it just, it, that, that's the way it is in Episcopalian. I never really saw a whole lot of outward religion in him. I know he loved me, and I know he loved other people. I know he had a Bible. Y'all, this man on his deathbed was quoting Psalm 23. He was going in and out of consciousness on the brink of life and death and saying, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. I didn't even know he had any of the Bible memorized. And he is quoting entire chapters of the Bible to himself, y'all on his deathbed. We need to be able to encourage ourselves with psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. Peter writes and he encourages these people, these elect exiles in all these different nations. Those nations include you and I. And then he goes into this. The great promises that are present in chapter 2. These are the things that he says we are. Four things that I want to look at. First one is this. He says, uh, you are a chosen people. You are a chosen people. Verse 9, you are a chosen people. The root word there is uh, for people is genus. Uh, in some translation, it says generation. If any of y'all study biology, you know you have genus and phylum and species and different ways that they divide people. And uh, uh, Peter is writing, and he is saying that uh, you are a chosen generation. You are a chosen race of people. You are a chosen ethnicity that has been brought together from all the other ethnicities of the world. And now you have been chosen for such a time as this. You are a chosen people. Now, realize, not only is he just writing to Jews... He's writing to Gentiles. He's writing to Gentiles. The, the, this division between Jew and Gentile that's present within the first century church is still a very real thing. They're still kind of working out the kinks on what it is to live one with another. And Peter is writing to them and he says, you are a chosen people. You are one new people in Christ and you have been chosen for such a time as this. Now, uh, this has the ethnic implications that he's dealing with right now. It has the social implications he's dealing with. It also has just the flat time implications. Why would I be chosen for a time like this, Lord? This time is horrible. This time is, could you choose for a different time? I mean, could you, could you have, Lord, why would you choose this time for me? I am stuck under Nero's heel right here in Rome and all these other people. I'm not writing to them because we live in the same neighborhood. I'm writing to them because they're exiles. Uh, you have been chosen for this time, is what he's saying. Those of you that are in Galatia, you've been chosen to be in Galatia. Those of you that are in Cappadocia, you've been chosen to be there. Those of you that are in Pontus, you have been chosen to be there. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I get kind of down and out about, you know, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to be around this situation? Why am I having to deal with this particular thing right now? And then I think to myself, wait a minute, probably because God wants me to do something about it. Whatever your job is, whatever your station in life, whatever your familial situation, whatever your age is, right then you are exactly where God wants you to be, and he has chosen you to be in that position, to be a light to those people. You are a chosen generation. That's present for the generation in 64 AD, and that's present for us here as the generation in 2022. Amen. Amen. He says, you are a chosen generation. And then he goes into this, which I love right here. He says, you are a royal priesthood. 
Now, the priesthood in the Old Testament was not something that was open to everybody. He, he, he's dealing with Jews and Gentiles right here, trying to figure out what it is to follow the same God, live together as neighbors and all this. Uh, he, he says, but now you are a royal priesthood. Wait a minute, Peter. You know your Old Testament. Why would you say that everyone is a royal priesthood? Peter, even under Judaism, not everybody was a priest. Y'all remember in the Old Testament, there was 12 tribes in Israel. Only one of those tribes was open to the priesthood, the Levites. Everyone was not a priest. Everyone uh, in Israel was eligible to have a relationship with God. Everyone was not a priest. Now, Peter, you're kicking down the doors of the priesthood to everybody? He says, yes, you are not just a priesthood, a royal priesthood. How can we be a royal priesthood? priesthood, Peter, because the great high priest 30 years before this laid down his life on Calvary. Amen. Amen. The, the great high priest came down and fulfilled all of that stuff, offered himself up as only a high priest can do, sacrificed himself because he was also the lamb. And now because that high priest now sits at the right hand of the father, you and I can be priests to God. We don't have to go before the priest and ask him to make intercession for us. We go before Jesus and ask him to make intercession for us. We don't have to go before the pastor or Nick or, uh, you know, Brother Kevin or Dr. Barnett. Oh, those people are nice, but we don't have to go before them to get in a relationship with God. We, we go to Jesus if we need Jesus, right? He said, you are a royal priesthood. He's writing this to Gentiles, too. Not only has he knocked down the wall of partition that was between Jew and outsider, but now he has knocked down the wall of partition that is between uh, Levites and everybody else. Everybody can boldly approach the throne of grace. Y'all, I'm glad that I don't have to pay somebody to have my prayers heard. I, I'm glad I don't have to pray somebody to have my prayers heard. I, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to do a whole bunch of rituals uh, to have my prayers heard. If I need something from God, I can just look up and say, Help! I, I need you, Lord. I'm down here. I'm in Rome. I'm in Babylon. I need your help right now because I need to encourage myself. But because I'm part of a royal priesthood, I can claim that. Now, being a part of the royal priesthood means not only do we have access to God, it also means we have a responsibility to the people that we serve. In the Old Testament, we had prophets and we had priests. Prophets uh, carried a message to the people on behalf of God. They would come before the people. They would say, y'all, thus saith the Lord. This is what he says. The priests would go before God on behalf of the people, and they would offer sacrifices. They would ask forgiveness. They would say, Lord, uh, I ask that your wrath would be spared. Lord, I ask that this prayer would be answered. I ask all these different things. They had a responsibility to live in a way that was commensurate with the God that they served. Are we acting priestly? If someone took inventory of your life and mine, would they say, there goes a priest? Would they say, there goes someone that is eligible of serving and representing and offering spiritual sacrifices up to the God of heaven and earth? If not, there are things in our lives that we may need to put set aside that way we can walk worthy of the calling that we've been called to. He says, you are not only a chosen people, a chosen generation, but you are a royal priesthood. And then he says this right here. I love this. You are a holy nation. Remember that illustration with Joey and the rocks? It's not that this, the, this other group of rocks right here uh, are, are hated by God, but this rock has been placed over here and sanctified and consecrated and set apart as holy. This rock is going to represent the character of God to the rest of the rocks. Y'all, that's what Israel was in the Old Testament. Whenever Abraham was called out of his homeland, uh, God chose a person. And then uh, it goes down to Israel, and God works with a family. And then it goes down to Moses, and he starts to work with uh, a nation. And then after uh, a nation, it goes down to David, and he starts to work with a kingdom, Israel, the one that's supposed to be a light to all the other nations. I'm going to rule the world from Israel. But then Israel went into apostasy, and now it's gone down to Jesus, and he's opened the doors to everyone through the church. 
You and I are called to be the extension of that holy nation. Now, I'm not talking about the physical nation of Israel, and I'm not talking about the United States of America. I'm talking about the nation of the kingdom of God. When Jesus and John the Baptist were preaching their message in the New Testament, they preached a message about a coming nation. Now, notice this. They did not say the democracy of God is at hand. They did not say the republic of God is at hand. They did not say uh, that this party of God is at hand. They said, what? The kingdom is at hand. Kingdom means utter submission to the king. He says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or that the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. You and I are called to be representatives and ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven. Now, there are certain privileges that go with being an ambassador. Just to kind of make the illustration, uh, if I was an ambassador for this country, I could fly to other countries. I could meet with representatives from those countries. And whenever I was doing my business with foreign countries, if I uh, had to go meet with somebody, I could go meet with them. But then after uh, I met with them, I would go back to my big fancy hotel that's called an embassy, right? Wherever you go in the world, the embassy for the United States of America, if it's in a foreign nation, that plot of land is owned by the United States of America. You are on American soil as long as you're on that embassy. You step outside of that embassy, you're on the soil of whatever nation that is. But as long as you're on that embassy, you are uh, on American soil. And if you're going to be an ambassador, you need to be able to go back and forth from the embassy to the rest of the world to conduct business. Now, if you want to be an ambassador, there's a requisite for that. You have to be a citizen of that nation. The New Testament talks about us being citizens of heaven citizens of heaven if you and i are going to be citizens of heaven we have to go through the citizenship process there is one way to be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven i want to ask us this morning have you been born again have, have you been born again jesus is talking to nicodemus in john chapter 3 Nicodemus is a Pharisee, and sometimes we kind of look down on the Pharisees because we have the luxury of having the entire book, and we say, well, the Pharisees were self-righteous, and the Pharisees were too religious, and the Pharisees really got away from themselves. And they did, but let's just kind of give them credit for a minute. They were probably doing the best they could with what they had. The Pharisees were trying to obey the orthodox teachings of the law as best they could. They got a little carried away from themselves, but they were working with what they had at the moment. And to Nicodemus' credit, even though he went at night, he did go up to Jesus and ask him a question. He said, good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Nicodemus, you seem like a good guy. You seem like a nice man. You seem like you've done all the right things. You've got to be born again. You must be born again. How can I go back into my mother's womb, Jesus? This is dumb. Why would you say I need to be born again? He said, no, Nicodemus, you don't understand. The first birth was into a world filled with sin. Unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, they cannot see God. I want us to ask us this question this morning. Have we truly been born again? Now, moving forward, I want to say this. We, we sometimes have done a disservice to the doctrine of the new birth by equating uh, some people's experience with the new birth and making that the standard for everybody else. Having the new birth experience does not necessarily mean that you have to go forward when they sing just as I am. It does not necessarily mean that you have to fall down and have tears in your eyes and you have to have this big emotional cataclysmic response. No, those things are real. Those things do happen. Some people do have very violent born-again experiences, but everybody doesn't emote the same way. Everyone is not the same type of person. God made us all different and unique and with our own special ways of uh, expressing ourselves. But what he is not willing to do uh, is sacrifice the principle. Some people may be born again uh, in Sunday school when they're very young. 
and they realize that they need a Savior named Jesus. Some people, when they come forward in our United Methodist tradition, uh, and they stand before the church on Confirmation Sunday, and they say, uh, will you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And when they say yes, they really mean yes. And they were sincere, and they were absolute in everything they could mean with the knowledge they had as a 12-year-old. God honors faith. For some people, it takes maybe a little bit longer, and you may be in high school, you may be in college, or you may be in your 30s or your 40s, or you may be farther down the road in life. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to fall out and have this big emotional experience where you were down in a ditch and then you got up. But what it does mean is that you have to realize that without Christ, you are lost and doomed for eternity, and you need Jesus to save you from your sins, and you're going to do whatever it takes to have a relationship with him, even if it means turning away from the habits of the old man and turning towards the habits of the new man and flee, feeding ourselves the things of God and fleeing from the lust of the flesh. I want to ask us this morning the question Jesus asked Nicodemus. Have you been born again? Do not leave here today in limbo on that question. If you want to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, if you want to be uh, an ambassador of the holy nation, if you want to be someone that Peter is writing this letter to and commending you to exercise your faith among the exiles of all the nations of the earth, you have to be an effective ambassador, and you cannot be an ambassador if you're not a citizen. One way into this kingdom. And then he says this. He says you are God's chosen possession or God's peculiar people it says in another translation you're peculiar you're different you're quirky you're strange a little bit you're not going to fit in with Rome it's okay you're not always going to fit in with Galatia it's okay you may not always fit in with Rustin. It's, it's, it's okay. You're, you're called to be a peculiar people. You're called to be God's own special possession. The book of Ephesians in chapter 2, it says, you're God's workmanship. You're his poema, his poem, his handiwork, his, his, his masterpiece. He's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so that you and I can proclaim the good works of him that did that for us. We're God's own people. Live like it. He's called us to be a chosen people. He called us to be a, a royal priesthood. He called us to be a holy nation. And he called us to be his peculiar people. All of those things are corporate. But we only can be who we are called to be corporately if all of us individually are striving to be who we're called to be individually. In high school, I played basketball. I told you all this before. I played basketball, Parkway High School, and uh, we were average. Oh, no, we were not good as it. We were bad as a team. I was an average guy on a bad team. Uh, we had an incredible amount of talent. We just couldn't put it all together. And my, my, I, we had several coaches, and one of my coaches would always say, the team is only as strong as the weakest man. Y'all ever heard that? Teams that? Anybody here ever played sports? I mean, the team is only as strong as the weakest man. It's the same for the body of Christ. If all of us collectively as grace are going to be a holy nation here in Ruston, we've got to build up one another. We've got to encourage ourselves, sing to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Encourage one another. Even though I'm down in the dumps and Nero is looking at me right now, I'm willing to encourage somebody else. We've got to encourage ourselves, be who we're called to be as individual citizens of the kingdom. That way we can corporately be that holy nation that Christ has called us to be. Just prior to this passage, Peter lays it out perfectly. Peter, if, if you remember, uh, Peter is having this discourse with Jesus early in his ministry. And uh, some of Jesus' disciples are dealing with the hearsay that's going on uh, in the surrounding region of who people are saying Jesus is. And Jesus hears it and he says uh, to his disciples, he says, I know everybody else is talking about me. They say, who do you say that I am? Not everybody else. Not everybody in the surrounding villages. You 12, the ones that I picked. Who do you say that I am? And we say, well, Jesus, you know, we, we really don't know. He said, some say you're a devil. Some say you're a prophet. No, who do, who do you say that I am? He says, Peter steps up. And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, you've 
Got it, Peter. And I will name you what? The rock. And on this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Thirty years later, the rock has been through some ups and downs. And he's writing to other disciples scattered about. This is what he writes to them. As you come to him, the living stone, talking about Christ, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, the other disciples he's writing to, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So the stone, Peter, the rock that followed the original cornerstone, Jesus, is writing to you and me, saying, y'all are supposed to be a bunch of little stones. I'm the rock. I'm writing to all of you as little stones, and we collectively are being built up into a spiritual house. How many of y'all have ever seen concrete mixed? It's a bunch of rocks, and it's a bunch of uh, aggregate, and it's a bunch of uh, cement, and it's all mixed together, but whenever it's mixed together, it's solid, right? I, I, I do remember this from... The one class that I remember in college, whenever all this is mixed together, there's different formulas that you have to follow. But if you follow the right formula, all that aggregate will stick together and you can build on that sure foundation. Christ is the aggregate. The Holy Spirit is the aggregate. And the mixture and the water and everything else that holds together all these disjointed and dysfunctional stones that you and I are called to be made holy and brought together so we can be a sure foundation for the church of Jesus Christ. As we leave here this morning, know here, know this and be encouraged that you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. Us collectively are a holy nation. And we are God's chosen possession, his special possession, his peculiar people. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to move to our hymn of invitation. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Uh, if you need to pray, feel free to pray in your seat. Feel free to pray at the altar. Uh, I'll come pray with you. Dr. Barnett can come pray with you. Somebody will pray with you. If you've not been born again or you're unsure about the status of your salvation, or maybe you just need uh, some comfort or some assurance, settle that with God today. I would love to talk to you. You can come forward during the song. You can talk to me afterwards. You can find me during the week. Talk to Brother Kevin. Make sure that you're a citizen. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. All hail the power of Jesus' name.
God's a good God. Amen. Amen. Uh, have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Uh, as we leave here, know that you are a royal priesthood. You can go to God for yourself. Uh, know that you are citizens of a holy nation. And we're called to be representatives of that nation wherever we go. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have a wonderful week. Thank you. This is the day.